welcome. Welcome to Newport, we've already had that welcome. Make yourself at home though. Make yourself at home. Get comfortable, take your shoes off, undo your belt, no, stop there, stop there. <laughs> Make yourself at home. But what do we mean by that? When we say home, what do we mean? Are we all thinking the same thing? When we, talk, when we start to think about things like homelessness, and when we think about home is, is Newport, or is Cardiff, or is, is Newport, what do we mean by home? <coughs> so I've been thinking about this, this idea about home for many, many years now, as Kim said, longer than I care to remember. And one of the things I ask in my research, and I've asked my students, is what does home mean to you? I pose this question. Some people say that the words house and home mean different things. I want you to think about what your home means to you. Just take a few seconds. Just think about this concept, this idea of home. Think about what it means to you. Now, I'm only an academic, I can't offer much, but I've got this amazing ability to see into the future. And I know that some of the words that you've been thinking of are on this next slide. Yeah? Can we tick them all off? So this is an exercise I've done with my students many, many years. Ask them, what does home mean to you? It's family, love, security, warmth, all these kind of things. But beyond that, we can start to kind of scrape the surface a bit. What I want to do in this session is to kind of get us to think critically about what this, this idea means and go beyond that. Because we can all produce these kind of lists of meanings. The issue is, are you and I thinking the same thing? Are you and I thinking the same thing? Are we, are we kind of, when we talk about home, do we mean the same thing? And that fascinates me. It's fascinated me for more years than I care to remember. There's two things here. There's a, a photograph of me in my back garden um, in 1971. I know, thank you, I don't look that old, do I? But 19, <laughs> 1971. And at that time, everything I knew about home, I'd learnt from the building behind me, from the person who took that photograph, and the person standing behind with his arms folded by the, the downstairs toilet door, my dad. So my mum took the photograph, my dad's outside with his arms folded. Typical kind of taciturn man. Um, and playing in that back garden. I also learned a little bit from that book, which I've kept all these years, I've got just here. It's the Ladybird Book of Homes. Now I know, I've, you know, I do read other books nowadays, but this is an <laughs> important book. So putting those two things together, you know, I've been thinking, I have been thinking about this for a long time. But why is it important? So what? Well, firstly, I think it's blooming interesting. I think as a, as a concept, it's fascinating to me to see how people from different genders from different backgrounds, from different countries, think about this, this wonderful, rich, evocative term, home, in different ways. And yes, you would, have, you, you would have used those words that were on the previous slide, but you would have used them in different kind of ratios, in different proportions. So I'm interested in talking about home for that reason, because it, it's intellectually interesting, and I think it's, it's good to think about. But also, I think now more than ever, politically, socially, culturally, it's important to think critically about what we mean by home. As I said, do we think about home as Newport? Do we think about home as a physical structure? Are we thinking about home as a, as a kind of store of memories? Are we thinking about, about home as Europe? And at this, at this kind of moment, it's important to think, you know, what, what, what do we mean? What are we, what are we, you know, are, we, are we sharing the same ideas? So what do the experts say? You know, dispensing with this for the time being, although I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it in a minute. Um, what do they say? Well, for an academic to say home is more than bricks and mortar, I'm not offering much. I think I could do, I could do better than that, because we all kind of know that, don't we? The kind of text that are on the slide behind me, I took this photograph at work a couple of weeks ago and I put the books on the floor in the corridor at my, outside my office and people were kind of scratching, what's Gurney doing now? He's taking, he's taking photographs of books in corridors. Just of illustrative of some of the things I pulled off my shelf and some of the things that I've been working with. And I've read all that stuff so you don't have to. But the kind of things that academics say are, well it's a place to entrust your sleep, I love that one. Per Ockness, 1988, a place to entrust your sleep. How beautiful is that? Poetic, isn't it? The place where we begin and end the day. We think about the home as a symbol of the self. Gaston Bachelard um, talked about the home as symbol, and Claire Cooper Marcus talk about 
a home is simple of itself. We can think about the home as a, an experiential warehouse. I like that one, the idea that it's a, a, a box that we fill memories and experiences with. So we're thinking about home as a physical structure there. And finally, we can think about home as a, a firewall against chaos. I like that one. The fact that this, this idea of security, which is, which is which certain, I'm sure people, people use that word when I, when I ask you to think about what home means to you. It's a firewall against chaos. I like that. One of the things that I, um, I was told to do when doing a TED talk is not to put too many slides, not, sorry, not to put too many words on the slide. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't see what's wrong with that. I think that's readable. And I'm consciously trying to remember that I'm giving a, a TEDx talk and not a lecture. So I'm not, I'm not giving out handouts. But um, just looking at this book, this is, this is obviously a, an important book for me. Um, I've bookmarked a particular page here, it's quite important to me. An empty house is not a home. This house is empty, no one lives here, so it's not a home. People make a house into a home, a family has moved in, so now this house is a home. Now I can't do a mic drop because I've got, I've got this on, but I mean, can't, you know, what? <laughs> and so we, we kind of know that. But lots of research, I mean, it's a fascinating topic, lots of research into this topic. So we talk about kind of clusters of meaning, territorial satisfactions, <laughs> themes, needs fulfilled, meanings, general categories. You can read all the stuff behind me. And I'm happy after this meeting to kind of share this stuff with you. Really interesting stuff, but more than just this. However, I, my problem with this is it's a bit... It's a bit list-like, isn't it, frankly? It is, inherently, it's a big list. It's a shopping list of meanings. And I've called this a kind of list fetishism, and I think that we can do better. I think, if we, think, if we only think about home as, as a list of properties or attributes, we kind of close down the opportunity of thinking more critically about home. And of course, it's interesting to study how the fact that different groups of people might think about home in different ways, but I think we could do better than that. And my problem is that I think for too long, we've thought about home as a, <coughs> a series of lists of relentlessly positive attributes. And we've kind of looked beyond the kind of, the, you know, we've looked beyond the shadows, the kind of darker meanings, the darker experiences we might, we might think about with home. So that's what I've been trying to do the last, the last few months, really. And I've started to think about the opportunities or the possibilities that these, these properties of home, that we, that we cherish so deeply, these positive properties of home, a bit like motherhood and apple pie. You know this expression, motherhood and apple pie? We don't think about them critically. And as a result of that, we take them for granted. And we, 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 we look, we look belong, beyond the kind of negative things. And I think as a corrective, it's just important to think about how some of these attributes that we, that we celebrate and we, and we cherish and are protected in law, the right of quiet enjoyment, of privacy, of security, of independence, things that we all want, we all want to protect. Some of those things that we, that we cherish actually can facilitate some harmful things. So I'm going to talk about four things. I'm going to talk about domestic violence within the home. I'm going to talk about health-harming behaviours. And by health-harming behaviours, I mean, I mean things like not eating your five a day, drinking too much, Smoke, smoking is denormalised in public places, doing those kind of things that we all know we shouldn't be doing at home, because that's where they most often take place. Thinking about accidents at home, and thinking about home and mental health. So it's all kind of jolly stuff. So I accept the fact that I've started off, I've given you a little thing to think about, and you're in a happy place, and you're thinking about, yes, I've got really fond, maybe not, seriously, maybe not, but fond memories of homes, and you're thinking about home in, ter in terms of these kind of positive things. Well, let's just let's think about the kind of the alternative. There's a, there's a large literature on, on home and domestic violence, about home as a place of coercive control. And let's think about it. It's this privacy, it's the absence of surveillance that allows coercive control, domestic violence, and all those other things that make home a place of containment, of vulnerability and of danger, allows them to happen. It's a famous book by Erin Pizzi, published in, in the 1970s, it's called Scream Quietly or the Neighbours Will Hear. <coughs> the neighbours will hear, will hear. So we can think about that, that privacy, independence, lack of surveillance, we can think about it in a negative way. This is fascinating to me. Um, 
It's fascinating for lots of reasons. My, um, I lost my father two years ago. He would, have loved, he would have loved to have been here. You saw him in the photograph before. And in 2017, along with 7,967 other people in the UK, he died of an alcohol-related illness. Um, in his retirement, his, his, his hobby was, was drinking. He did that at home. I would wager that if he was doing that outside in a public place, he, they probably wouldn't serve him. Beyond the kind of scrutinising eyes of the state, of neighbours, he was, he was drinking himself to death because the death certificate said that he died of necrotising pancreatitis and cirrhosis of the liver. So it was a kind of double whammy. There's no kind of debate about that. So health-harming behaviour like excessive alcohol consumption, like lying on the sofa, eating junk food whilst watching Strictly, I'll be there tonight. <laughs> smoking, because we can't smoke in public place. All these, these, these things we shouldn't do. Where do we do them? We do them at home. So I'm starting to think about home, yes, as a place of all these positive attributes, but also as a, um, as a, as a place of harm as well. This, um, this chart here is particularly interesting. Um, it shows that basically over the last 18 years, we're on average drinking about the same amount around about seven litres per person per year. But look, we're drinking much more at home than, out, than in bars, public places. So it's kind of, you see what I'm getting, getting at with this. Yeah, that's <laughs> We think about the health and safety executive protecting us from accidents at work, but actually the dangerous places at home. Rossford estimate there's around about 6,000 deaths per year for accidents at home. What kind of accidents? We live in a bungalow is a message. It's falling downstairs. And of course, certain groups of people are more vulnerable to those kind of accidents. Very, very young people and very, very old people. Poisoning is obviously important in terms of um, protecting younger children. The graph on the, the left, on your right-hand side, my left-hand side, um, shows the number of, of deaths in dwellings from house fires. And again, we, you know, it's, each one of these, these numbers is a person, is a family. It's important, important to remember that. And finally, so it's kind of, there's lots of positive um, thinking speakers talking about lots of life coaches, which I'm looking forward to hearing. I'm, I've kind of, I'm, as many of us have in this room, I think, I had, had my kind of dark times, had a period of depression when actually I felt the home was cheating me. Far from this nurturing, welcoming space, it was a place where I felt worthless, I felt anxiety, and I felt, yeah, it didn't feel good. And what happens when that occurs? When you, you, know, you can't sleep off depression, you can't stay in, in the house forever, you can't not go to work forever. And that got me thinking about the, the, the kind of things that hope offers. And again, it's you know, this, this privacy, this independence, this ability to control our own environment sometimes can kind of bite us, can't it? It can come back again. The Welsh Government's recently undertaken a consultation on connected communities and eliminating or tackling social isolation and loneliness. In Wales, there's a new strategy to address this. Joe Cox did a similar thing in England. And one of the things that came out of that that fascinated me is the, the, more, the mortality risk of social isolation and loneliness is equivalent to that of the, the risk from grade two and grade three obesity. Also, suicides most often take place within the home environment. You've got that chart there, around about 5,000 deaths per year. Um, from suicide in the UK. Consistently, these, these more often than not take place within the home environment. And that's interesting in terms of the, the kind of common narratives of where suicides take place. Between 58 and 62% of uh, men and 62% of 68% of women during that period took their own lives within the home environment. So, why am I telling you all this? Um, clearly, I have been interested in this for a long time. I think it demonstrates the, the power, the significance of thinking critically about home. And I think when we start to think about the, the, the negative um, consequences of how these attributes might kind of turn back on us, I think we start to think in different ways. Let's get moving beyond the taken for granted. So for instance, we talk about <coughs> homelessness, <coughs> crucially important, home, uh, housing issue, but what is, it, what is it that people are missing out on? What is the less in homelessness? 
I think it's important to, you know, let's continue this conversation. Let's continue to think critically about home. It's too important to be left to academics, frankly. So when we talk about homelessness, what, what's missing? We talk about rehoming dogs and cats. What does that mean, rehoming, sub-home, non-home, de-home? What might these words mean? And I've not got any answers. These are essentially rhetorical. That's what academics do, isn't it? We do critical thinking. But let's think about what those terms might mean and how we might apply them. And I say that because to simply say, you know, to read the Ladybird Book of Homes and to say that homes are simply more than bricks and mortar, frankly, is a little bit like saying, well, rugby is more than whales and sheep. You know, as, you know I think you should expect more from your academics. Well, I'm saying, kind of join us. Let's all think critically about what home means. It's too important to be left to dusty old textbooks and libraries. And I'd like you all to kind of continue this conversation. Thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure meeting you. And um, <laughs> take care.